So today's video is going to be the first part in a multi-part series on making a fully functional tic-tac-toe website. And you might be wondering like how hard could it possibly be? But my goal for this is not just to make it functional but incorporate as many things as possible in it. For example, today what we're doing is focusing on the design part and making the animations. And you can see when we click around, it has some very very smooth and nice looking animations. And this video we're going to show you how to do all of this. In further videos, we might look at implementing an AI to make this work and supporting a lot of other stuff such as like color schemes and everything else. So it's going to be a very cool project to work on. So without further ado, let's get started. Before I start coding, usually what I do is just make a basic prototype in some design software. For example, now I'm using Figma. And I do this basically just to see how it looks like. I'm not the type of person that designs every single button and makes them interactive at every single page, because for me that's a little bit too tedious. And after a bunch of different versions that looked pretty bad, this is what I came up with. Although there isn't too much more going on with this design, there's one small thing that I think is pretty important. And that is, the circles are actually a little bit bigger than the square. So when you click on this, you can see the circle is 75 by 75 pixels, while the square is only 70 by 70. And you can see if you select both, you can clearly see the gap between these two. And the reason I did this is that it makes it a little bit more visually balanced. As in, although it is not exactly mathematically precise, to your eyes it looks pretty similar. Because kind of the square takes up a little bit larger volume and it pokes out more on the sides. So for curved objects, you usually have to make it a little bit bigger. And this also goes for when you're designing stuff like a circular logo next to some text or some square objects. And just to show you what it would look like if it wasn't, the square, you can see, this is actually basically the exact same size as the square. And I just shrank down all of the circles to be the correct size. But now when you look at it, you can see it's a little bit too small. And it feels like there's a lot more gap between here than it should be. What I just described there is called overshooting. And this is most widely used in fonts, for example. And this font is called Futura. And you can see that although it looks perfectly aligned and very nice looking, when you add some lines to place it at where the text should start and end, you can see that, for example, the pointy bit of the V goes in quite a bit below the baseline of the text, and so does the pointy side of the A. The H having flat ends stays in the correct place, while the O also sticks out a bit. And this just creates a visual balance that makes it look more straight than if you actually made it straight. And now I have resized everything so that it technically fits in the lines, but you can see when you remove the bars and also zoom out a bit, you can see it looks a little bit weird and wonky looking. So then what I did is basically duplicate this frame a couple of times and see what it will look like in different situations. So here is my first prototype of having a header text, and then I decided to make a different font that's very bold and also it matches the colors, so it kind of looks like part of the game. And then what I did was try to find a way to illustrate how to show which three shapes connect right. And this is my first idea, but then it doesn't quite look quite right. And also, it would be quite a pain to do the same programming and make a diagonal line and make a slash through it. So I decided to not to do this. What I started on was making the stroke pretty thin, so that now you can see the circles are lighter and you basically fade out everything else except the winning ones. And I think this makes it pretty obvious to see. Then what I realized is that this is a completed one, and you can see it's very easy to see the grid. But if it's not complete, it's pretty hard to know where you can click. And the worst case scenario is that if you have nothing, obviously you don't know where the shapes are. So what I have decided on is essentially using the fade out technique from the winds, but just make it so that it kind of fills out all of the circles. So if it is circle smooth, then what you do is essentially make everything a circle, so you know that when you click on there, it will be a circle. And after you finish clicking that place, for example, and you place it there, everything else morphs into a square, so you know that you can click now and it's the square is smooth. And that's basically it for this, and let's move on to the programming part. So, of course, we couldn't just export what we designed as an image, because I wanted to be interactive and also have a nice animation. So I looked at SVGs, or Scalable Vector Graphics, which is something that kind of acts like an image, but it's made out of vectors, so when you zoom in, it is still sharp, and you can, more importantly, change it over time however you want. And I found this animate tag, which you can use to change the property, and that looked pretty good. 
but as I tried using it, there's a bunch of weird glitches and stuff didn't work the way I expected. But then I realized that because we're only using circles and squares, we can literally just use a normal HTML div and apply a border radius and stroke and shadow of some kind. And that will work exactly how I wanted to. So onto the actual programming. What I did is just create a default HTML with the default tags and stuff, and I linked a CSS style sheet which I created also. And essentially the only important part about this is I made a button that has nothing in it, and I just gave it a couple classes box for like a single grid item, I guess, and also circle, so that currently it is a circle and filled as in it is filled and not the hollow stroke form. And then I had just a bunch of buttons to toggle the different toggle the different states of this. And for now I just use class name because I couldn't be bothered to, you know, use a better approach. And I just gave like box circle field, box square, box square field, and all the possibilities. So I can basically toggle through these and like see what it looks like. So onto the CSS, which is the main part of this. Of course, I use this thing called dot root to declare CSS variables. And in case you don't know what they are, it's basically if you start a property with two dashes, they become your own variable and you can set it to colors, pixels, width, and anything you want. And for now, I just declare the colors of the circle and the square so I can repeatedly use it and only change it in one place. So of course, I just started with the default starting for all box elements, which is giving a margin, making the background transparent, and also adding transitions for background, border radius, border, transform, width, and height. So I just added a bunch of them with slightly different animation times that I felt was the best. I gave it a padding of zero. So for the squares, I made a 70 by 70 as I have said in the design, and made a border that was one pixel, solid, and using the primary color. So for this, this is what this is what it looks like. And something I figured out was that you need to use a property called filter drop shadow instead of your regular box shadow because if you try this, you can see what it looks like. If you just say 12 picks, 12 picks, 0 picks, like that, and comment out this line, you can see that even though the middle is transparent, the shadow actually doesn't apply there and it doesn't follow the stroke. It just makes it a solid color. And that is obviously not what we want. So I had to not use the box shadow and use this thing called the filters drop shadow. And that works exactly the way we expect. Same thing for the circle, except I made it, like I said, a little bit bigger with 75 by 75 pixels, a border one pix, and using the color for the O. And also made a border radius so it's round. And that's basically how I changed it from a circle to a square. And by using only animatable properties such as border radius, border and background, you can see that everything is very nicely animated. I also added so that when you hover on any of the boxes, the border width kind of increases a bit so that when it is hollow, you know that when your mouse goes over it, you can click on it. Another thing I did is use the active pseudo selector so when you click, it actually shrinks a bit so there's a little bit more tactile feedback. And finally, I added the field properties, which for the box, all I did is make the border very large made the border go all the way in. But that didn't look very good, so I also added a background, so they kind of fade in at the same time, and I think it looks pretty fine. For the circle, I just increase the border, and that's the only thing you need to do. So now you can see when you click on all of these, they animate very, very nicely. So now let's actually make the tic-tac-toe board. What I'm gonna do is delete these temporary buttons and only leave the main actual shape button. I'm gonna make this a square because the first move is of course a square. And also make it so that it's not filled. Great. What I'm gonna do is basically create a div and make it a tag called um, box container. And here I'm just gonna duplicate this nine times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in the CSS, what we need to do is select the box container element. And now what we do is give it a display of grid. So that makes it a grid of table so we can make it actually three by three. And what we need to do is grid template columns. And here we, we can say it's 100 picks, 100 picks, 100 picks. So there's a little bit of spacing between them. And we can basically duplicate this line and make it the same for grid template rows. Awesome. Instead of giving a margin of 20 over here, 
we need to align the kind of center-ish because here it looks all pretty fine but once we change a square for example into a circle you can see it kind of increases the size a little bit and moves around we want to align it the center so so here what we're going to do is make the margin perfectly match up with the width and height so it adds up to 100 pixels in total so for this of course 100 minus 70 will be 30 so half of it will be 50 on each side like that and for the circle since it's 25 we have to give it a slightly smaller margin of 12.5 and you can see that now it actually kind of works. So we also add a margin to this very long list of animated properties. Like that. Margin 0.2 seconds E. So now that we have this done, when we change it to a square, to a circle, you can see it all changes very nicely in the same place. Great. And that is basically our board done. So now let's give it a little bit more like actual interaction. So let's create a new file. Let us save it as script.js like that. And we're going to link it into the HTML. So script src equals script.js. Great. Now let's just create an array called um, let board equals a 2D array of 3x3 three three values. So here we're going to have an array. And then we're going to give it 0, 0, 0 and just basically copy that twice so comma that comma comma so that will be our empty board right here we can also add another variable called step which we can say let step equals zero for now so we can say function make move and we can give it an x and a y and this is going to be a very simple function in which we just say board x y equals basically step modulo 2 plus 1 like that and what I'm doing here is basically if it is even it will give you 1 and if it's odd it will give you 2 so when we set it as 1 that would be a square if we set it as 2 that would be a circle and that matches with the step count and we have to check if it's not 0 so we can do this great and it auto formatted the code for me, but it doesn't really matter. Now all we need to do is basically add an on click to all of these buttons. So we can just say on click, make move, and then we can say zero, zero for this one, and then etc. We do it for every other one. And for now, I have just manually inputted all of the values and positions of each piece. So if we make it so that it consoles and logs the board on each turn. You can see that when we go to the console and click, you can see that it should work as expected. And of course, that's because I forgot to make step plus plus, which will actually change the step. And it should give you alternating circles and squares like that. Great. We should also put this in here. So now everything is working. We need a way to actually update the board itself after this has moved. So what we can do is basically give it an ID for each individual thing for example the first one would be zero zero and then we can do it for every other one like that so now we have that done we can just go back to the script and make a function called uh, update board and all we need to do is loop through each element so for let i equals zero i less than three i plus plus github copilot is helping me a lot um let j so now what we can do is just close the two for loops like that. And now we can just essentially get the current element by saying let element equals to document query selector i dash plus j. So that will get it by the element. Let's just make like a switch case thing. So case one zero case one and case two. And so we can just close it. So we can just say um, element dot class name equals to box. So here's the thing: if we want it to be placeholders, it should be updated every single time to be the current step. So we can just say um, box plus step 
divided by modulo 2 and here we can just say um, equal to 0 and given that we give it either a box or a circle great and then we break so let's just copy and paste this to the other two cases except the other two are a lot more simpler so instead of saying this all we need is box square failed and same thing with this and then we have to just say um, box circle failed and what we do is call update board each time we make a step and you can see that works as expected except something weird happens when we have the empty one so definitely I have messed something up somehow let's see if a parenthesis would solve that and it does so you can see now everything is a circle so you know it's circle's turn and now everything is a square and now that fails because I need to start play like this so everything is a square you click that makes a circle everything else becomes circles that's a circle is a square and you can see everything all nicely animates and I think that's where I'm gonna end this video for today this is part one I on part two I will come back to make the rest of the UI and everything that's actually important and so thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe and like this video for the next one